Domestic politics certainly influences American foreign policy towards Cuba, with politicians reluctant to cross the Cuban exile community in Florida, which is, after all, a crucial swing state. Yet attitudes, amongst young people especially, may be softening. Sylvia Wilhelm, an exile who left Cuba as a child, now travels to the island frequently to help reunite families. She thinks that letting the wives of the Cuban Five visit them in jail would not be politically toxic these days. I think it is extremely important for them to be given that right. And I also think that it would be a very good, um, uh, like, act of good faith on the part of the Obama administration to, to send that message that, you know, family reconciliation and reunification takes precedence over politics. For more than half a century, Cuba and the United States have been entangled in a bitter brew of resentment, violence, and domestic politics on both sides. This has left a legacy of distrust and anger which was never going to be easy to undo for both countries. And the Cuban Five are increasingly part of the mix. Well, as you saw, I spoke to one of the five, René Gonzalez, who maintains his innocence from behind bars in Miami. I can now talk to his daughter, Irma, who's joined us on the program. Thanks Hello. for coming on. Um, Irma, let me just run thing, one thing past you. In a BBC poll that we conducted, 96% of Americans had never heard of the Cuban Five. Does that shock you? Well, it doesn't. I know. And it's very sad that they don't know. You think they should know? They should. They should. They were in Miami uh, trying to prevent terrorism from happening here in Cuba. Uh, and uh, they should know that they are in prison for fighting terrorism. I know that if the United States people will know about this, will be shocked because they should know about the truth of the five. They are in five jails in the United States. They have been suffering from the violations of their human and legal rights. And they're being in jail for 12 years. And the United States public doesn't know about that. And let's get one thing straight. They actually cooperated with the FBI before they were jailed. Well, uh, uh, some of them even gave information to the FBI about uh, drug dealings that took place in terrorist, the terrorist organizations they infiltrated. Uh, regarding uh, the, the, the people in, in, in the United States, they were in the United States. Also, these terrorist organizations that not even, not only uh, try to hurt people in Cuba, they were also dealing in the United States. But the, uh, but the Cuban government also in 1998 gave information to the U.S. government about the, about the terrorist organizations. Right. But on the other hand, Irma, it has to be said, I know this is your father, uh -huh. but he was and the others were convicted in a court of law mm -hmm. for espionage. No, not espionage. Sorry, conspiracy to espionage. Some of them conspiracy to commit espionage. But, but there was a conviction in a court of law. Yes, but it's conspiracy. There was no evidence that they committed espionage because it was proof on trial. Even general, a general from the Pentagon talked in trial saying that there was no evidence against the five that, that could uh, say that they committed espionage because to commit espionage you have to gather secret information from the government and they were only infiltrating Organi terrorist organizations that have nothing to do with the government. Briefly, you saw your father just three months ago, but your mother has not been allowed to see him. No, no, she's been denied the visas uh, nine times, and uh, nine times, nine times, and uh, lately the humanitarian parole, because uh, she was living in the U.S. when my father got arrested, and two years after, when the trial was going to begin, because the trial began two years after uh, they got arrested. Uh, the prosecutors tried to negotiate with my dad and told him to testify against the other four and, uh, and say lies because then he ha will have to say that they were committing espionage. Like he said no because he wouldn't do that. They uh, detained my mom and then deported her back to Cuba and they have been denying her the visa to go and visit him, not even a humanitarian visit. Got to leave it there. Irma Gonzalez, thanks very much for talking to us. The story of the Cuban five there. As you've seen throughout tonight's program, the BBC has been given rare access to broadcast from inside Cuba. It's a country from which Matt Fry has reported several times, most recently in 2006, and he joins us again now to reflect on what, if anything, has changed. Matt, it's been four years since you were last in Cuba. Tell me, from your impressions this week, what has changed, and I guess just as interestingly, what hasn't? Well, what has changed, Cathy? The answer is precious little. I mean, I know they like to talk about some of the economic reforms dipping their toes into the rather tepid waters of the free market by allowing some farmers, many thousands of farmers in fact, uh, to, to own little plots of land and then to sell vegetables on the market. That indeed has happened. To be honest, that's the only visible change I've seen. 
when it comes to ration books, when it comes to employment, when it comes to the general misery of the economy. If anything, things are worse, partly because of the three hurricanes that took 10% out of the GDP of this economy in the year 2008, partly also because of the global economic crisis from which Cuba has not been immune. Politically, what has changed? Also, very little indeed. I mean, tiny little hints of debate here and there, but in the broader scheme of things, uh, this is still a very closed political society. Matt, you mentioned earlier in the program the death uh, just this week of Orlando Zapata, the dissident who died after a lengthy hunger strike. How much can we read into Raul Castro's unprecedented statement of regret? I know that trying to understand Cuban politics is a bit like Kremlinology, but should we see there a political change? Not massively, I don't think. I think the fact that he expressed his regret um, is a nod to the kind of understanding of the broader picture here. But at the same time, the statement issued by the uh, Cuban government also talked about the fact that um, America was involved. It talked about the fact that he was a, you know, a, a common criminal, not a political prisoner, and so on and so forth. Uh, I don't think that this particular incident today, although tragic, this week I should say, although tragic and although it offers a glimpse into Cuba, um, is as significant as the general climate of self-censorship and fear that does still pervade here. You talk to people about Castro, they barely even mention his name, whether it's Raul or Fidel. Whenever they talk about the regime, the government, their voices are almost automatically lowered, whether they're ordinary people or intellectuals or businessmen. There really is a sense of fear here, despite all the good things in this country, the education, the health care, the tourists love flocking to this place, the culture. All that is great. There are so many problems, Cathy. Okay, Matt, we will see more of you, of course, from Havana tomorrow. Matt, thanks so much for joining us. And do stay with us here on BBC World News America. For decades, the U.S. trade embargo has taken a serious toll on this island nation. Could a thaw in relations now be underway? Among Cuba's greatest exports is its culture, and their world-renowned dancers are some of their finest ambassadors. I represent my country in every place, in every theater, every stage. I dance. It's a, it's a kind of uh, my identity. And welcome to La Plata San Francisco in the heart of old Havana. Now, relations between the U.S. and Cuba are a bit like a bad marriage, constantly arguing about the sins of the past. Just last week, we had the latest spat in this particular category when a U.S. diplomat here uh, visited with uh, opposition figures in Havana. That went down really badly. Then, of course, we had the death of the dissident, the Cuban dissident this week. Again, the United States accused Cuba of being a serial violator of human rights. We have Guantanamo Bay, the U.S. detention center at the other end of this island. There are so many examples where things have gone wrong over the years. President Obama has lifted travel restrictions somewhat, but the U.S. trade embargo is very firmly still in place. And Cuba constantly accuses the United States of interfering in its eternal affairs. If it is a marriage, it is a marriage made truly in hell. Here's our man in Havana, Michael Voss. Emotional reunions after years apart. <laughs> Dolores Perez left Cuba nine years ago. She's one of thousands of Cuban Americans arriving on daily flights from Miami now that President Obama has eased restrictions for visiting relatives back home. They come loaded with gifts, clothes, medicines, toys. For the past 50 years, communist Cuba has lived under a U.S. trade embargo. Even basics are considered luxuries here. This car should be in a museum, he says. Relations have started to ease between the two countries. But on key issues like the trade embargo, Washington still demands that Cuba must first show signs of reform. The embargo is embedded in our law. The president doesn't have the authority to completely do away with the embargo, even if he were interested in doing so. And, and, and President Obama said he needs to see more evidence that Cuba would be responsive, change its policies, release political prisoners, uh, so many other issues. So I think what we're doing, which uh, uh, is moving the ball forward. Political prisoners remain one of the key stumbling blocks. The unofficial Cuban Human Rights Commission estimates that there are some 200 dissidents behind bars. 
The Cuban authorities say they're all mercenaries paid by the U.S. to undermine the system here. Despite the differences, there are exceptions to the trade embargo. I've just done a little supermarket shop and there's everything in here from frozen turkey to barbecue sauce to tinned carrots. And all of it comes from the United States. This is an American container ship sailing into Havana Bay. Over the past 10 years, Uncle Sam has become Cuba's largest food supplier, earning U.S. companies half a billion dollars a year. There is frustration here at the continued U.S. demands for change and anger that the island remains on Washington's list of state sponsors of terrorism. The Cuban authorities appear in no mood to compromise. The island's communist system, they say, is not open for negotiation. We believe that the United States government has to leave behind uh, the policy of putting preconditions or conditions in Cuba in order to change policy towards Cuba. We don't see the United States government putting on other countries, even on countries with which they have differences, the same conditions they are uh, requesting uh, from us. At times, both sides can move to the same tune. Thousands flock to see Cool and the Gang, the first U.S. band to play here in years. Cultural exchanges are back. But 50 years after the revolution, change is not proving easy for either side. Michael Voss, BBC News, Havana. So what about the broader picture? Well, I spoke to a man earlier today who should know. His name is Ricardo Alacón. He's a very close friend of Fidel Castro. He's been involved in the running of this country, intimately involved for the last 60 years or so, 50 years since the revolution. He is currently the president of the National Assembly. And one of his particular issues that he cares deeply about is the issue that we spoke about last night on this program of the Cuban Five. So I asked him why the case of the Cuban Five resonates so strongly with ordinary Cubans. Terrorists against uh, our people is a very important issue for us. That message that, you know, family reconciliation and reunification takes precedence over politics. For more than half a century, Cuba and the United States have been entangled in a bitter brew of resentment, violence and domestic politics on both sides. This has left a legacy of distrust and anger which was never going to be easy to undo for both countries and the Cuban Five are increasingly part of the mix. Especially, maybe softening. Sylvia Wilhelm, an exile who left Cuba as a child, now travels to the island frequently to help reunite families. She thinks that letting the wives of the Cuban Five visit them in jail would not be politically toxic. Domestic politics certainly influences American foreign policy towards Cuba, with politicians reluctant to cross the Cuban exile community in Florida which is, after all, a crucial swing state. Yet attitudes amongst young people these days. I think it is extremely important for them to be given that right. And I also think that it would be a very good, um, uh, like, act of good faith on the part of the Obama administration to, to send